Hi, listeners. Welcome back to Adopting the Podcast. As always, I'm so excited to be your host for this journey. I'm Nicole Witt, Executive Director of the Adoption Consultancy, where we guide pre-adoptive parents step-by-step through the adoption journey. In adopting the podcast, we're going to focus on the issues, questions, and concerns you have as you get started in your adoption journey. This is for people just considering, brand new to, or early in the process who are trying to get their questions answered and figure out their best path forward, learn about what to expect and how the process works. In our last episode, we talked about openness and adoption, what it is, what it looks like, and how it works, even if you've adopted more than one child and have different levels of openness with their separate birth mothers. So if you haven't checked out that episode yet, it's a great introduction to the topic. Today, however, we're going to dive a bit deeper into a critical element of open adoption relationships that doesn't get discussed often enough. And that's the power differential in the relationships, how that power differential fluctuates over time and how it can have real impacts on your adoptive parenting. So joining me today to address this important topic is Catherine Russell. Catherine is a licensed master social worker and the executive director of Absolute Love Adoptions, which is a nonprofit serving Pennsylvania through home studies, placement services, digital courses, and a line of custom curated gift boxes for birth mothers called Solace. Thanks so much for being my guest today, Kat. Thanks for having me. I am super interested in this topic. I think it's a really important and often ignored aspect of of all personal relationships, frankly. Can you please share with us how your interest in the power dynamics between birth parents and adoptive parents came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So as a social worker, I've been in this adoption space for about 10 years or so. And I felt like I was seeing the same things happening over and over again, mainly that a birth mom would feel like she was the center of attention during this process. And adoptive families were feeling like they had no control. Mm -hmm. And then once placement occurs, the, the pendulum was swinging so abruptly that birth mom felt like she vanished. And the adoptive family felt like now they had all this power and control and they weren't necessarily sure what to do with it. So I started finding that those relationships then, these open relationships were hard. It was hard for people to find equilibrium for both parties. So I found that birth parents would say that they were afraid. They were afraid of overstepping. They would say things like they felt like they were walking on eggshells. They felt like they just absolutely vanished. And then adopting parents were then struggling with how to behave. Mm -hmm. How do you treat this person now? What are the implications of the choices that you make? So I started thinking, if we're encouraging families to pursue openness and we want families to be healthy, we have to give them the tools to do it with. So I started building this training for families to explore openness and to do that well. And it really snowballed into this concept of power dynamics, because at the root of all of these relationships and at the root of all of these these complicated situations after placement was this power dynamic. So I started really looking at what is power? How does it affect human relationships? I heard I heard these scenarios all the time, but I wasn't hearing it talked about in terms of power. So mm-hmm. I just started really digging into how power looked in these adoption relationships and what we could do, how we could teach people about this power beforehand so that they could possibly reduce those conflicts and then really build better foundations for their open adoption once they really understood what that power looked like. I'm so excited to talk about this. I I, I think it's just so important. And what you were describing up front about how there's that abrupt shift in the power in the relationship, it's it's true. And I've seen people struggle with that time and again. So I, I just think this is so important. To be clear, for the purposes of our conversation today, we're going to focus on the relationship starting at the placement and going forward and not so much during the course of the match. Is that correct? Yeah, because I think during the course of match, we're, we're basically looking at expectant mom having all of the power. And there's very little that that alters that. Once you take placement and that pendulum swings, that's where all the complications really begin. Mm-hmm. So that's really where we'll focus. Okay. So circling back to a couple of the things that you mentioned, can we start at the very beginning by talking about what is power and what are the different types of power? 
Yeah. And I think this is fun because I think when we first say power, especially when we're talking about human relationships, people get like, oh, they don't really want to think about that because it feels icky to think that you're bringing power into a relationship. And then I think we instantly start thinking about dysfunctional relationships where the power isn't balanced and they become abusive or harmful. So I want you to think about power as an asset. It's currency. It's how you show up to a relationship. It's how you carve out a space for yourself in a relationship. It's the wisdom that you bring to a relationship. It's the value. It's interesting because as humans, we really try to create hierarchy in our relationships. And we do this this unintentionally. It just happens. It's part of how we're designed. So we do this, but a lot of how we're carving out that space in hierarchy is through expressing our power. So I want to say it was in the 50s. There were two psychologists who started this this study of power and how it looks in social relationships. Mm -hmm. And they identified, I want to say, five categories. And then over time, research has really expanded on those categories. So when we're talking about these adoptive relationships, knowing what these power titles are, are, it's not really important. But I think for the listeners to get a sense of what power they might have and how they might be using it, especially in this adoption space, I'll give you those titles. Real quick rundown. So we look at these as coercive power, which is obtained through threatening somebody else. Uh, Reward power, which is just that, giving a reward if they do what you've asked. Formal power, which is really power of title. So for this purpose, it's that title of mother or parent. Connection power is that ability to offer resources. Referent power is uh, the power of being liked. Informational power is having knowledge and information. And then expert power is when you have exceptional skills. So hearing those, again, no need to memorize those, but I think you probably get a sense of where you might have power in relationships that you sustain now that are healthy. Okay. Okay. That's so interesting. And so how do we use power in relationships and, and how does it apply to the adoption triad? Yeah. So it's really interesting because there's this phenomenon that exists within adoption that was one of the reasons why I really started exploring why power looks like it does. And it's this concept of triangulation. So the symbol for adoption is a triangle and we see that as a good thing. And it is a good thing because triangles are exceptionally strong. We use them in architecture a lot because they're so strong. However, in human relationships, when there are three parties in a relationship, we tend to triangulate, especially when we're having conflict. So what that means is maybe two people are having a disagreement or two people have different experiences, different desires, and they push their desires onto that third person and ask them to choose. So we see that a lot with adoptees. They start feeling like if birth parent an adoptive parent feel the need to assert their power over each other, it becomes exerting power over this entire triad, which then ultimately puts that pressure onto the adoptee. So the adoptee starts feeling that pressure of triangulation. So because of that, we really want to search and push for equilibrium of power between birth and adoptive families so that everybody in this relationship can really thrive. So that that's a kind of a unique concept to human relationships that really shows up a lot inside of adoption. Okay. Okay. And in your experience, what are the influences on an adoptive parent and, and kind of how they show up to the adoption space? There are a lot and I've built an entire course around it because there are so many, it comes down to the lens. It's really this, this way that you perceive certain concepts that affect adoption. There's a lot of them. I think the most important one that I see having the biggest impact is how people look at this concept of mother as a noun versus mothering as a verb. And I think that's really, really important because We live in this culture that really we glorify motherhood and we tend to, I guess, assign value to women based on their relationship to parenthood, to motherhood. Mm -hmm. So we have, we also then have really narrow ideas of what a mother is. We we tend to think a mother is a parent and that that's both the noun and the verb. But I think in this adoption space and this, this relationship we're talking about, it's so important to make that distinction. And this is important because the child in the adoption triad has two mothers and they always will. 
regardless of what that mother on each side of that triangle is doing or not doing, by the structure of adoption, they have two mothers. And that's the reality. So adopting families really have to do that work to explore how that feels for them. How does it feel to parent a child who will always have two mothers? And a lot of that I find comes back to how that adopting mother perceives their role and responsibility as a mother in title and also as the person who is mothering, doing all of the the tasks of motherhood. That would look like caretaking, right? Mm -hmm. Tending wounds, giving baths, reading stories, creating connection. That's mothering. But we all have this history of being mothered, and it's not necessarily restricted just to our mother in title. We've often had experiences being mothered by other people, maybe older siblings, maybe aunts, maybe grandparents, maybe our best friend's mother, where we spent a lot of time. So if we look at our own lives, we can see that we've been mothered by more than just our mother and that that was good, that that was nutritive, that was a positive thing. So for adopting families, really digging into how they perceive motherhood and mothering versus mother will really help them to figure out how they can make space for a birth mother in that equation. Super interesting. And then you you mentioned right before we talked about that question, the goal of nurturing that equilibrium, right? And how that's sort of the best approach for the adoptee. So how can an adoptive parent nurture that equilibrium in the relationship? Again, lots of ways to do it, but I'm going to limit it to just my I think what is the most effective, and it's a lens shift again, it's recognizing that the way we see this process of adoption might be flawed and to restructure that could go a long way at helping us open up our space so that we can, we can desire equilibrium and we can work towards that. So for me, it's this idea that adoption is often viewed as a legal process. And what that does is contribute to this sense of ownership over this child. With adoption, we're really transferring rights to this child, responsibility of this child from one family to another. And so often in this space, we're really encouraged to look at adoption as a time-bound process. It's a legal process. It's over and done and on you go with your happy family. And a lot of families come into the home study space feeling that that's what they think this process is. So we do the work with our families to really help them open up. And recognize that, yes, adoption is a legal process, but at the core, it's a social process. It is a person or partner who is ready to parent through adoption. They're showing up and they're saying, I can be a resource. I am safe. I am healthy. I'm stable. And I want to parent. And you're showing up for a resource for a mom and or a dad or a child who are in need of resources and you are that resource. So it's really this joining of two families, the sharing of resources. And I think that for families, if we can really figure out how to get away from perceiving adoption as primarily that legal process and instead see it as primarily a social process, I think we we just instantly create space for there to be more more mothers involved in this child's life and more more desire to have that equilibrium. Okay. So so speaking of social processes, I mean, just as with any other relationship in life, the dynamics change over time, over the life cycle of the relationship. Can you speak to that a little bit about how the power influences behavior differently in different stages of the relationship? Yeah. So in the beginning phase, when an expectant mom has come to the adoption space, she has all of the power because she's the one growing the child. She's making all of the decisions about the health of that child, the pregnancy choices, all of it. And then during the birth stage where we're we're starting to prepare for placement, mom starts to slowly lose that power. You start to see the professionals around her start to push in, the adopting family shows up. So it's this real slow disintegration of her power. And then once she signs those consents, instantly that power is transferred to the adopting parents, particularly in states where she has no revocation period and it's final at signatures. So we see this massive swing really, really quickly. So the power dynamic is inherent then moving forward in everything that that we do. And I think what I see is that we all like to be on our best behavior. We want to be good humans. But when we're under great stress or we have strong emotion, we tend to kind of devolve a little bit. 
into behaviors that might not be as as kind or as, as socially acceptable. And both sides of the equation, birth families and adoptive families do that. I think one of the kind of hallmark stories of, of how this power influences behavior is in the stories you hear about adoptive families who come to the table and say, yes, we will. We promise to keep this open. We promise to send pictures. We promise to keep you really authentically mm -hmm. as a part of our family. And then they receive custody of this child and they leave and they right. completely cut off contact. And that that's the worst case scenario of power really gone awry and that equilibrium really being reduced to nothing. But that type of behavior is all influenced because of that abrupt power swing. So it, it shows up a lot in almost everything we do from that point forward. But that's a really good example of it. It's showing up in a really negative way. Mm -hmm. So what are some common behaviors from, from birth families or adoptive families that, that either help or hurt this whole dynamic? So I think piggybacking off our la of the last story I told, I think that the other behaviors that might align with that, and we're talking really, really hard behaviors. Like, granted, most behaviors exist on a, a continuum and, and we're not right. always very, very harsh, but some of the more very harsh behaviors I've seen would be just that making false promises. Some families are very, very skeptical that expectant mom or birth mom is scamming. And so they show up very tentatively there. Maybe they spend a whole lot of money on expectant mom living expenses. That actually hurts equilibrium. That in conjunction with some language that I see used a lot in, in these phases of the adoption process, language of ownership. Mm -hmm. So for an adopting parent calling this woman who's an expectant mom, calling her birth mom before she signs any paperwork. Right. Or, and sometimes calling her their birth mom, right? <laughs> Versus yes. the child's birth mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I hear that a lot too. Yeah. It's, it's, she's not your birth mom. She's your child's birth mom. And I think that saying my child too goes hand in hand where we're saying, something about my child naming this child I and mean, really kind of defining a life for this child before adoption occurs. That's that's all language of ownership. And we really want to avoid doing that. I think one of the other things I see a lot is families erecting barriers instead of boundaries. And there's a huge difference. You know, a, a boundary is saying this is the behavior that we find tolerable. This is our safe zone. This is where we're comfortable. These are expectations for our relationship. A barrier is saying, we cannot cross this line. And what families often do, especially around adoption and, and at that placement point, is they get scared. They get territorial. They get fearful. And so instead of saying, that's outside of our comfort zone, how can we work this out? They say, no, thank you. That's not appropriate. We're not speaking anymore. So mm -hmm. really making sure that we're focusing on boundaries and how to create equilibrium, set up some rules and expectations so you can have boundaries instead of going right to barriers when things don't go perfectly well. So those are some of the things that, that very obviously hurt equilibrium. And you had asked for some things that might nurture equilibrium. The course that I created about this, we really structure this around three categories. I think there is a ton that can be done within the idea of openness, both structural and communicative openness. Those are different. That can really, really set a foundation for equilibrium and keep it there. I think ownership we touched on a little bit earlier, just reframing those ideas of who's who's mom and why, uh, what does that look like? And just this general idea that we don't own our children. And then written agreements, those post-adoption contact agreements that we encourage people to do, I think those are underutilized. I mm -hmm. think we we see those agreements as just some extra paperwork that gets filed in court. And it's the extent of the relationship we're supposed to have with birth parents after placement. But I really think seeing those agreements as a, it's a conversation. It's an opportunity to look at what both of you are expecting for post-placement and have some conversations that might be difficult, but really figuring out what's going to work in the long, long run for all of you. And knowing that these things change over time and that ultimately this child is going to take ownership over this post-adoption agreement and the relationship that, that it defines. But I think that those written agreements, we sometimes think, are for the adopting family to know that they only have to do A, B, and C. And we miss this whole piece that for a, a birth mom, that's telling her that you see her, that you recognize that she's important, and that you promise to do certain things for her, which for her relieves a massive amount of fear that you're just going to go away. And even women who have been in these long-term open relationships, they still say they're afraid that the family is going to go away. 
So these post adoption agreements are essential, I think, in really helping to create a foundation for equilibrium. So uh, speaking of those agreements, I, I think, you know, we were talking about how you have that abrupt shift in power at the time of placement. So when people are discussing those agreements, they're doing it at, at a point where one party has significantly more power than the other, right? And so often it's during the course of the match and that's when the expectant mom has the power. And I feel like the adoptive parents are often so nervous that if they propose something or say something that she doesn't like, that she's just going to walk away, right? And then that's when you end up in this situation where they're saying, yes, 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 we'll do that. And maybe that's not the right fit for them or for the relationship. But again, it kind of all comes back to that power situation. Can you speak to that or how you address that in your work? I think some of that is those conversations with both parties early on that this isn't a jump when I say jump. This is a conversation. This is entrusting for a birth mom. It's entrusting her child to a family that will try to meet her expectations for for her child's life. So if we're talking about this in the beginning as this is not a contract, this is not just another piece of paper. This is a tool to help you facilitate conversations. I think that families can be a little more gentle with how they respond to these requests to do things. They might not feel like, well, you know, expectant mom said jump, so I'm going to do it. They might be able to take their breath and say, I understand what she's asking. I need a moment to think about that and really think about that, how that's going to look. I also think this has to be said that for most people who come to adoption, they're coming to this space because of infertility. So their feelings of maybe fear, anger, resentment, they're typically just below the surface. And so when you get into this situation and you're looking at this woman who could do something usually so easily compared to the challenges that you've had and is is maybe not inviting this pregnancy in her life where where that was something you so badly wanted there's this kind of under the surface trigger for adopting parents that's always there so i think there's sometimes this response to okay mom said to do this and they get real upset real quickly because they can't believe she's asking for this or the other reaction of i'm just going to do whatever she says because i really want this baby mm-hmm. so i think really just prepping that and just any old baby's not going to do this is so much more than just getting a baby this is making a match with a woman and her family and her story that you then invite into your life forever and it has to be the right fit and if you start working through this post adoption agreement and feel like you're just not lining up then let yourself say this is not the right fit and trust that you will find another fit at a point in the future. I know that's like impossible to think in the moment, (laughs) but it's your lifetime that you are, you're putting on paper there. Right, right. And so you and I both know that closed adoptions are extremely rare these days, but, but once in a long while, they still happen. Or like we were talking about with relationships evolving, sometimes a more open relationship evolves to become more closed or, you know, it goes through different phases. So how does this look differently in a clo- more of a closed relationship? So in a closed relationship, there's much less power dynamics at the surface. You're not seeing them play out as much because you're not having interaction. So what happens is so much of that power struggle and that need for equilibrium then exists between the parent, the the adoptive parent, and the child. The child sort of becomes the spokesperson for the birth parent in that closed situation. So I think the idea is then to nurture openness with the child around the idea of being adopted and around their story so that they can continue developing positive identity related to being adopted, despite the fact that their birth parent is not engaged for whatever reason. I also think it's important to note that birth parents sometimes aren't engaged for whatever reason, and then they are. And so for this moment in time that we're trying to focus on building equilibrium, we have to remember that that's going to look different later. And hopefully at some point, if if birth parent comes back into this child's life, you've done the work to create a really neutral, equal space for that relationship to enter. So that's really what I think about closed relationships. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And so before we wrap up, I just want to circle back to one topic. You mentioned it in passing. And when you and I were originally discussing doing this episode on this topic, you had mentioned it a bit more about how this all relates to birth certificates and naming the baby. Can you please address that a bit further? 
Yes. So this is kind of the passion piece for me in talking to people about this topic and doing some presentations on these topics. This is what really gets people excited and not always in a good way. So unfortunately in adoption, this process that we use for birth certificates is extremely archaic. And it came from this, this time within our adoption history where it was clouded in secrecy and shame. And so we started this process of birth certificates where a person is granted this initial birth certificate, the original, and typically birth parents do that. They fill that out at the hospital that gets filed. The process of adoption then takes place. And then when you get to finalization, the family officially adopts the child and then they issue an amended birth certificate. That birth certificate takes the place of that original and the original in many states is locked away. And to get access to that original birth certificate is very challenging, if not impossible for, for adopted people. We're seeing some laws change now, but it's still very, very, very difficult. So this process is basically taking this original birth certificate, which is supposed to mark a person's entry into the world and mark what tribe they belong to, where they came from. It's their story. It's our start of our story. We get this original birth certificate. But through adoption, that original certificate is basically voided. And our life on paper then doesn't start until this amended certificate is issued. The birth parents' names are changed to the adoptive parents' names. The child's name is changed to whatever name the the adopting family wanted. And in some states, the place of birth is even changed. So we're basically then giving this child a certificate that's a lie and telling them that this is their origin story this is the mark of their entry into the world. And it's not. So for the adoptee community, this is really a painful piece of the process. Mm -hmm. And for birth parents, when you have this child, you grow this child, you love this child, you birth this child, and then you become a ghost legally. It's like you never existed in the relationship with this child. That is extremely dismissive. And that obviously really, really sends a message that equilibrium does not exist in this relationship. So the birth certificate process is a massive, massive punch towards equilibrium. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do if you're in a state where like they don't allow access to that original. For some time, I've had situations where an attorney would not even allow me to have a copy of that original to give birth mom so that she could kind of have the certificate that that this experience was real for her. So There's a lot of advocacy groups who are trying to change that. And I absolutely encourage listeners to get involved there and really help amplify those adoptee voices saying that that process should not continue to be that way. The naming of the baby really goes in conjunction with this, because as I said, that name that the birth mom puts on that original birth certificate becomes erased and it becomes whatever the adopting family chooses. What is so essential about naming the baby is that we need to remind families that this process should be done together when it can be with the birth family. Oftentimes we hear from adoptees who say, my birth mom named me something and then my adoptive family named me something. And once I saw that original birth certificate, I went back to my birth name. And that happens a lot. That original birth certificate, that name your birth family gave you matters. It marks you. It it tells you where you belong. For a lot of people, that's the only relationship they might have to their birth story. So it's really important. And I think adopting parents get mixed messages about that. I've actually been in trainings before where professionals have advised families to avoid having conversation about names unless a birth parent brings it up, which let me tell you, please don't do that. <laughs> please make sure that you're you're asking for these conversations and, and trying to coordinate conversations so that this is not something that becomes a source of pain for both the birth parent and the adoptee. We have a really great blog on our website that I had written about some ways to go about naming the baby that are collaborative. And um, again, when you can be, there are definitely situations where this is just not possible, but I think it's important for adopting families to recognize how important naming is, particularly when you're naming a child who has two families. Well, so I really appreciate all this information. Finally, Kat, what resources can you offer our audience to learn more about power dynamics and adoption relationships? 
Well, first and foremost, the course we're building, A Tale of Two Mothers, should be coming out this fall. We, on our website, absoluteloveadoptions.com, you can submit a message to me so that once that course is ready, I can send that to you. We have a ton of resources on our website that I try to put up there whenever I listen to something that's really moving, really powerful, especially around these power dynamics. I plop that there. So visit that website. And I had mentioned a little bit around when we were talking about birth certificates, about adoption history. And I still think that knowing why adoption looks like it does is so important for people who are pursuing adoption. So I absolutely recommend American Baby by Gabrielle Glasser. I'm sure many people have read that before. It's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful resource to understand, again, why it looks like it does. And then I really love the Adoption, the Longview podcast with Lori Holden Mm -hmm. because I think she's a podcast in this space that's very much focused on the life, the lifespan of the family and resources that we often miss during home study, placement, all of that. We miss them. And then we're parenting and we're like, what's going on here? (laughs) So I really think she's got a lot of great resources. And of course, Nicole, your podcast is the same. You've got a lot of really great resources for families who really need to understand what to do after placement. So I recommend families look at any of those resources and really dig into some of these topics. Awesome. Yeah. And Lori's podcast is on, on our same platform here. So that is easy for people to find. Yay. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Thank you so much for all this excellent information. Again, listeners, my guest has been Catherine Russell. LMSW and Director of Absolute Love Adoptions. She can be reached via her website at absoluteloveadoptions.com and on Instagram at Absolute Love Adoptions. And thanks to her generosity, listeners of today's episode can use the code capital S, capital O, capital L, and then the digit seven for a 10% discount on a purchase of a Solace gift box for birth mothers. And you can find those at www.adoptsolace.com, A-D-O-P-T-S-O-L-A-C-E. But of course, listeners, most of all, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. I hope you've heard something today that will help you to be more intentional about this critical relationship and more cognizant of the different factors at play. Take care and I'll catch you next time.